France's worst villain, hounding Jews, persecuting Jews. Paul Touvier sent my mother to Auschwitz. Members of the Catholic Church who were pro-Nazi helped him escape. My job is to arrest Mr. Touvier. Finding the man is not going to be easy. They searched a number of monasteries. We were stepping into a sacred place. When I started, nothing could stop me. World War II has been over for 43 years. Yet France's most notorious war criminal is still at large. A Nazi collaborator who murdered Jews and resistance fighters alike, Paul Tuvier. Now a high-ranking French detective has the job of hunting him down. It was in March 19, 88, when a, a magistrate of the Paris court gave me a, the Touvier case. Le Colonel, Colonel Raccordon is someone who's very determined. Très volontaire. When he decides to do something, he'll do everything he can to make it happen. He met tous les moyens pour y aboutir. Over the years, the French National Police have tried and failed to bring the war criminal to justice. But Colonel Jean-Louis Recordon has a hard-won reputation as a tough and skilled investigator. His latest mission is top secret. For roughly 40 years, Touvier was hidden somewhere and uh, nobody was able to arrest him. Combing through the Touvier case files, Recordon is transported back to one of the darkest periods in French history. When the Nazis invaded France, some Frenchmen heroically resisted. Others, like Paul Touvier, wholeheartedly collaborated. He worked with the Germans during the war. In fact, they joined with German units to actually fight the, against the resistance. As one of the leaders of a pro-Nazi paramilitary force, Tuvier's job was hunting down enemies of the state. Tuvier selected seven people, and he said himself it was because they were Jewish. They were stood up against the wall and shot. Simple as that. He's a France's worst villain. Even in the 1980s, there are people in high places who collaborated with the Nazis people who are sympathetic to Paul Tuvier. I was concerned about potential leaks because I was fully aware about the fact that in the French administration, but not only in the French administration, in the French society, Tuvier had supporters. When someone's been hiding for 40 years, the chances of finding him are next to nothing. I mentioned to the magistrate the fact that this case should be an impossible mission. But when I started, nothing could stop me. For this mission impossible, Colonel Recordon teams up with seasoned investigator Dominique Bélanger. When I received the Paul Touvier file, I knew it was very sensitive. Our division only dealt with very sensitive cases. It was a secret investigation. I was fully blind, I would say. I have no information about his current physical appearance, of course. The problem with searching for Paul Tuvier was that we didn't even know if he was alive. Tuvier faked his own death because at some point he had put a notice in the newspaper, Paul Tuvier is dead. But since there was no proof of his death, we continued with the investigation. 
I started to define the Touvier networks, his relatives, his supporters, and all people mentioning in the dossier. And I was interested by uh, one uh, fact. I noticed several times the influence of the Catholic Church. It has long been rumored that Paul Tuvier has been sheltered by elements within the French Catholic Church. He clearly had received some important support. If it's true, it wouldn't be the first time that sympathetic clergy have aided and abetted Nazi fugitives. I think members of the Catholic Church who were pro-Nazi helped people escape after the war. The church had this tradition of standing outside the secular authority and assisting those people in trouble without asking any questions. This part of the French story is always very controversial. It does seem very fishy that everybody who helped the Nazis happened to be connected to the Catholic Church. The hunt for war criminal Paul Tuvier has exposed deep religious and political divisions in France that date back decades. When the Germans defeated France in 1940, they carved the nation in half. The Nazis occupied the north. In the south, they set up a puppet government based in the town of Vichy. The Vichy government created their own version of the Gestapo, the fearsome milice. The milice was created essentially as a paramilitary police force to fight the resistance. It's an expression and its ideology of the most extreme elements in, in Vichy. And it's overtly anti-Semitic. And Tuvier made a career uh, in the milice. And he really took to it. And he did so well that he was promoted. He became the person in charge of intelligence gathering for the milice office. He was an absolute um, ideological fanatic. The Jews and the resistance, um, these were enemies of France, and they were um, to be eliminated. Well, after the war, there was a serious effort in France to purge French society of people who had collaborated with the Germans. Collaborators like Paul Tuvier, who was desperate to avoid the hangman's noose. Tuvier came from a devout Catholic family. He was a devout Catholic himself. And when he looked around for help, he thought perhaps um, the church could help him. I assumed the Catholic Church could be an important element to be investigated. Recordall discovers that Tuvier's last known mailing address is the Lyon Archdiocese. We wanted to obtain the authorization to examine the archives of the Archbishop. It was quite a delicate inquiry. The magistrate and the detective drive 300 miles south to Lyon. They decide the magistrate will meet with the Archbishop alone to gain his trust. obtain a meeting with uh, the Archbishop, but I stay outside the Archbishop office. I was very anxious. It was sensitive. The Archbishop was very reluctant to authorize the police to investigate a Catholic archives. Recordon's request to see the archive is turned down flat, only fueling his suspicions. For me, it's an habit to meet numerous people who don't want to cooperate with me. It's not a problem for me. OK, you don't want to cooperate directly? OK, I will use another way. 
Nine months into the investigation, Recordon is convinced that Tuvier is being hidden by elements within the Catholic Church. To remain impossible to find, to stay hidden while in France, the perfect place for this was a religious setting, whether in monasteries or abbeys that could shelter entire families or individuals. Police concentrate on the right-wing fundamentalist movement within the church. We were focused mainly on one in the monastery. Due to the fact that the Touvier worked for a certain time in the 70s around this monastery. It is the Notre Dame de Dome monastery in central France. I decided to send Bélanger inside the monastery in order to find some clues of the presence of Touvier or his family. Officer Bélanger goes undercover posing as an ex-convict seeking charity. We were stepping into a privileged, secretive place. It's another world, cloistered and also protected. It was a very impenetrable system and very effective. It's very difficult to infiltrate these religious communities. There's an element of mistrust. Very few lay people gain access. I worked there during the day and at night had the run of the abbey. Belanger searches for clues. Every detail we gathered motivated us. But the undercover operation yields little. There were several people staying at the monastery, but none of them resembled Touvier. It was demoralizing. We had to come up with another strategy. So the team tries another tack. They tap the phones of a number of fundamentalist religious communities. We had created a network of phone taps in every place where Paul Touvier could have been called. Paul Touvier aurait pu être appelé, en fait. All wire taping devices were remotely connected to the basement of my offices. When you do phone taps, you hear many different voices. But when you listen to the same people constantly, you start to recognize voices. You know how they speak, what they're talking about, and who's there. That's the technique of phone tapping. And then we got a lucky break. An article appeared in a national newspaper talking about Paul Touvier's relationship with elements of the church. By chance, an investigative reporter has also been delving into the war criminal's past. Like the police, the reporter concludes that Tuvier is likely being helped by Catholic fundamentalists. The article gives investigators their first major break. As soon as the article was published, we started overhearing phone conversations. Certain people were worried about how the press had discovered this information. Right after the article came out, at one point, we heard a phrase we understood perfectly to be, our friend Paul is not going to be happy. For me, it was marvelous, very, very nice thing. And people were saying, we have to help our friend Paul. Paul is now under surveillance. We have to take care and so on and so on. One call in particular offers a strong lead. On the phone is Jean-Pierre Lefebvre. 
the head of a renegade right-wing Catholic group called the Knights of Notre Dame. The Knights are part of the fundamentalist movement. At the other end of the line, Dom Lafon, abbot of a Benedictine monastery called St. Paul de Wisk. It seems that the Wisk monastery and uh, the home of Jean-Pierre Lefebvre could be two links of the chain. Detectives have evidence linking war criminal Paul Tuvier to a monastery in northern France and a secretive far-right Catholic sect. I decided, with the agreement of the magistrate, to launch the operation. I sent two different teams, one in Wisk, in order to make an investigation in the monastery, and the other team to the home of Jean-Pierre Lefebvre. The manhunt intensifies. Belanger arrives at the Wisk monastery, armed with a search warrant. It wasn't normal practice to enter religious institutions. We questioned Dom Lafon. He wanted to phone his superiors and tell them what was happening. He thought that would scare us. Lafon was smiling, thinking we had no chance to find Touvier. We conducted a search. Dom Lafon didn't believe it. Police just didn't search a convent. Belanger grills the abbot, but Lafon insists he knows nothing of the war criminal. We said we would stay with him. We detained him for 48 hours. He realized we weren't going anywhere. Eventually, the abbot cracks. In a startling admission, he reveals he is part of a conspiracy to protect Paul Touvier. He puts us on to the Knights of Notre Dame. Now detectives pull in the leader of the Catholic sect, Jean-Pierre Lefebvre, for questioning. When Jean-Pierre Lefebvre was in the hand of an investigator for interrogation, he started to deny to know Touvier. But the teams already discovered that Lefebvre and Touvier share a dark past. The militant religious leader once fought alongside Nazi SS officers. In the basement of the house of Jean-Pierre Lefebvre, the investigators discovered numerous documents related to World War II. Like Paul Tuvier, Lefebvre was one of thousands of French who betrayed his country. Tuvier worked closely with the notorious Klaus Barbie. Barbie was known as the butcher of Lyon, Tuvier, the hangman of Lyon. Klaus Barbie was the head of the intelligence branch of the Gestapo office in Lyon, and Tuvier was the head of the intelligence branch of the police office in, in, in Lyon, and they were certainly in the same line of work. But Barbie was German. Tuvier had no such excuse. He was a traitor who terrorized his own countrymen. 80,000 Jews died in France during the occupation. About 76,000 of them were deported. His activities as a member of the Milice um, combined um, hounding Jews, persecuting, chasing down Jews, fighting the resistance, but also he becomes very much of a mafia-like figure. Vladimir Zant's mother was at a Lyon synagogue when Tuvier and his henchmen showed up. Paul Tuvier come with his truck and stop in front of the synagogue tilt seat, and some men enter the synagogue. He took all Jewish people, among them my mother, and was directed to a prison in Lyon, then deported to Auschwitz. It is crimes like this that have led detectives to question the leader of the Knights of Notre Dame about Paul Tuvier. 
Several hours later, the investigator came in my office saying he don't want to speak, he don't want to cooperate. It's why I decided to join the interrogation. Recordor tries a ruse to get his witness to open up. I made a remark saying there is other hunters who are on the track of Paul Touvier, and these people are going to work for their own interest and are very ill-intentioned regarding Paul Touvier. When I said this, Lefebvre looked at me carefully. Wiesenthal, Klarsfeld, I shrugged the shoulders. It could be. He hopes Lefebvre will think it's safer to turn Tuvier over to police than to risk Nazi hunters like the Klarsfelds or Simon Wiesenthal getting hold of him. And I said, if something wrong happened to Tuvier and his family, you will be responsible. The ploy works. The former SS officer admits the Knights of Notre Dame have been funneling money to the war criminal. Lefebvre told me that each month he sent 3,000 French francs, roughly 600 US dollars, to a women located in Paris. Paul Tuvier's flight from justice has been more than 40 years in the making. After the war, he was convicted in absentia of treason and war crimes. Tuvier, it manages to stay in hiding and to survive until the 20-year statute of limitations runs out on, on the charges against him. What he wanted was to be able to inherit and to move back into his father's home, move in with his wife and children, lead a normal life, if you will. While the charges against Tuvier had expired, he was still banned from owning property in his hometown. He was keen to reclaim his property and his reputation. The only way he could get an inheritance when his dad died was to get a presidential pardon from President Pompidou. In the 1960s and 70s, Tuvier still had friends high in the French government and clergy. After a long and vigorous campaign by a sympathetic bishop, in November 1971, he received his pardon. When President Pompidou pardoned him of his last remaining charges, it, it backfired. Protests erupted across France. Famous Nazi hunters Serge and Beata Klarsfeld spearheaded the demonstrations. The reaction of uh, the world of the resistance uh, was uh, impressive, uh, many protests. Uh, there was outrage that, first of all, that these crimes had essentially gone unpunished after all. Uh, regardless of the legal questions, I mean, this man was a murderer, unquestionably a murderer. We protested immediately, and we invaded even uh, the house of Touvier. Touvier was under siege. Desperate, he agreed to do a television interview in disguise to defend his war record. But what could I have done? What? Faced with the Germans, who were the masters of the country. But his victims weren't fooled. They filed lawsuits against Tuvier. As a result, he was now charged with crimes against humanity, charges which hold no statute of limitation. Tuvier goes from being a man who looks like he's going to slide back into kind of a comfortable anonymity and live in, in his family home to a celebrity of, of, of the worst kind. Um, and then he's forced to go into hiding again. It's these charges of crimes against humanity that have led Recordon and his men to pursue Paul Tuvier. Now, the detectives follow the money trail to Paris and the elderly secretary of a Catholic charity. We confirmed that there was a network set up to collect money. The money was passed on to Touvier through a woman named Geneviève Penou. Recordon pays a visit to Penou to question her about the money. 
I explained to this woman the purpose of my investigation. But she answered, she don't want to help. I was amazed by this kind of answer. Finally, Recordant wears her down. She requested to phone her priest in order to obtain his agreement because she don't want to be in infringement with the divine justice. It was, it was amazing, it was amazing. The priest advised the woman, please give the information to the investigator. Madame Penu reveals that she has been sending money to Paul Tuvier at a fundamentalist Carmelite convent 200 miles south of Paris. For her, it was an obligation according to the Catholic rule to help this family. At this stage of the investigation, things started to accelerate very quickly. So the team left Paris by plane. At that time, the police had their own planes, and four of us left. Another group went by car. After four decades, the net is closing on Paul Tuvier. But there is a real danger. If he gets wind of the operation, he will vanish. It's why I decided to move very quickly. French detectives are closing in on war criminal Paul Tuvier. They have flown to his last known hiding place, a convent 200 miles south of Paris. A sister was surprised about the huge number of police officers in front of her. I said, I am in charge to perform an investigation in your convent. Donc on rencontre la mère supérieure. We met the Mother Superior and the Abbot. We told them why we were there. We had to conduct a search. The team questions the nuns, while Recordon confronts the Abbot. And I started to interrogate this priest. Tuvier, I don't know Tuvier. There was a small chapel behind some buildings and garages. I was at the entrance discussing with the priest when one of my investigators came to me saying, we have found some suitcases with the name of Paul Lacroix. In one building, we found some cases labeled with a name that we recognized as one of Paul Touvier's aliases. We opened the cases and discovered Paul Touvier's past. And the first thing we saw was the Iron Cross. I look at the priest. You don't know Touvier? My investigator looked at the document, Paul Touvier, Paul Touvier, and so on. You, you don't know this guy? Investigators haven't found the war criminal, but they have found solid proof that the fundamentalists have been sheltering him. In one trunk, they discover writings by Nazi propagandist Philippe Henriot. It is a direct link to one of the worst wartime atrocities committed by Touvier. Philippe Henriot was um, the minister of propaganda under Vichy, and he was a, a hero of the milice. Philippe Henriot was an extremely effective radio commentator. He was doing quite a lot of damage to the uh, Allied cause. He was uh, really getting somewhere with these radio broadcasts. The resistance uh, assassinated him on the 28th of June. And throughout France, militia groups 
and other supporters of Vichy decided to exact vengeance. The account that finally emerges is that he rounded up a number of Jews, and then he took seven of these and took them out early in the morning at the end of June 1944, and lined them up against the cemetery wall and shot them, and left the bodies as examples for people to see. Paul Touvier must have been living there, but left very quickly. There were current photos of him with his children, his wife. This was our treasure. We had a photo. That was important because the most recent photo we had was from 1973. We questioned the abbot. He said he didn't know anything. I say, you have to respect the French law. Now, where is Paul Touvier? The Mother Superior takes matters into her own hands. Mother Superior asked the abbot to swear on the cross that he didn't know anything. He was trapped. Mother Superior really shook him up. She made him admit that he knew where Paul Touvier was. He said to me, Touvier, for two weeks, is at the Saint Joseph Monastery in Nice. It's a critical point in the case. But Nice is 500 miles south on the Mediterranean coast. There is no time to lose. It was 11 p.m. Due to the fact my team was very tired and more tired than me, I decided to take the wheel and to drive myself until, until this. Nothing could stop my investigation. French detectives drive through the night. They're heading for a monastery in Nice. After more than a year, the hunt for war criminal Paul Touvier is entering the end game. We had to move fast. We hadn't slept since Monday. We've been on the go with no rest. We drove at 150, 160. I took one uh, photograph with me. And with this photograph, now I can put an image on a guy. Now Touvier, for me, was very well identified. Colonel Recordon calls ahead to authorities in Nice. He asks them to surround the monastery so that no one can arrive or leave. And I said it was a very important uh, uh, case. I cannot uh, uh, speak about it by phone but I have in my pocket an arrest warrant. At dawn, we arrived on the outskirts of Nice. There were already six or seven undercover police officers surrounding the monastery. Recordon told my colleague and I to go around back so we could enter from the rear and the front at the same time. But we weren't sure if he was inside. We had our doubts. We just didn't know. I knocked at the door and uh, the priest opened the door. He was surprised, and I suppose a little bit terrified. The panic priest tries to keep the investigators out. I had placed my foot in the door, and violently, I opened the door. In the meantime, we were in the courtyard, broke down a door, and met up with Recordon. Four of us were inside, but there was only one central staircase. And my investigators rush 
in the staircase. I grasped the sleeve of the priest, and together we climbed the staircase. At the top of the stairs, there were two corridors. Recordon went left with one colleague, and I went right with another. My investigator, a few seconds opening on each side, the door, and I followed, taking the priest by the sleeve. And at this stage, my heart was bumping quickly. And near the end of the corridor, I noticed an investigator stand still in the frame of the door. And in the middle of the room, I saw Paul Touvier. After more than four decades on the run, Nazi collaborator Paul Touvier is cornered. When I saw this guy standing in the middle of the room, instantaneously, I recognized him as Paul Touvier. Paul Touvier had a distinctive look. He had piercing blue eyes. I remembered war films with blue-eyed Nazis, and that shook me up. A few seconds later, a wife came, followed by her son and her daughter, crying. And Touvier, brusquely, nastily, ordered them, shut up, go back to your uh, rooms. What they did without a word. And I recognize the guy in charge of the intelligence service of the milice when he spoke to the resistant, to the Jew. And I think it was the same guy, the bad guy, very bad guy. As for his children, it was sad. They were 35 or 36 years old, and they'd never had a life. They had always lived in a monastery or abbey. Colonel Recordon called me to tell me that Paul Touvier had been arrested. This was a big moment for me, because all of the efforts we had put in together had concluded in a positive result. It was a clap of thunder. Fantastic. For me, I won. I just won my investigation. <laughs> I don't know uh, how in English uh, I say soulagé, uh, I was released. After the two year arrest, I have a thought concerning the, the poor people in the concentration camps. And I thought, now is the justice time. We had, after 40 years, finally arrested Paul Touvier. There was a flood of journalists. Touvier faces six counts of crimes against humanity. He read a statement to me. I dispute having committed crimes against humanity. I was only doing my job. He had no regrets. The investigation has shone a revealing light on a dark and secretive corner of the French Catholic Church. Paul Tuvier's arrest also shows that anti-Semitism is alive and kicking in modern France. Within days, death to Jews is scrawled on a synagogue in Rouen. Five years after Tuvier's capture, his trial opens in Versailles, once home to France's kings and queens. Tensions run high in a nation still scarred by the war. One of the big moments in the trial is that during the 80s, he kept these notebooks called the Green Notebooks. And while he, at his trial, denied that he had maintained the same animosities he'd had before the war, when the Green Notebooks are read at his trial, it's clear that ideologically, this is a man absolutely frozen in the past. It became clear that he was very much the same man who had joined the milice and was willing to carry out crimes. Tuvier was a very hateful man. 
These secret notebooks help seal Tuvier's fate. He is found guilty of crimes against humanity and sentenced to life in prison. It's an historic verdict. Tuvier was the first French citizen to be tried for and found guilty of crimes against humanity in a French court. And that's really quite extraordinary. Uh, there are not many countries that have prosecuted their own citizens for crimes against humanity. I was looking for my mother all my life. Paul Touvier was the man who arrested my mother and sent my mother to Auschwitz. Paul Touvier has to assume the responsibility of my life, of my hell. The end of Touvier for me was a classical inquiry. Challenging, demanding, and also the right will, the determination. It was possible to succeed.